On this podcast, you'll find interviews with high-performing, successful individuals in life sciences. On a weekly basis, we cover their proven methods, principles, strategies, and mindsets to implement new technologies that scale to meet the needs of people in our world. Welcome to the Life Science Success Podcast. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Don. I'm a consultant in life sciences. And today on the podcast, we're going to be speaking with David Barham. And uh, we're going to talk about his company. But before we hop into the podcast interview today, I just wanted to quickly mention I'm headed off to Bio June 5th through the 7th. Uh, I will be, uh, you know, cutting my trip a little bit short, but I will be there for the first couple of days just doing interviews. So for those of you who are around and would like to, to be on the Life Science Success Podcast, please be sure to go to the, the web address that's mentioned at the very bottom of the screen here. So it's web.d3digitalmedia.com forward slash bio-2023. So with that, in this episode of the Life Science Success Podcast, my guest is David Barham. David is the co-founder and CEO of Amendo Biotherapeutics, and Dave, David has taken Amendo from pre-seed stage through multiple financing rounds and successful acquisition in 2020. So with that, welcome, David. Thank you, Don. Thank you. Thank you for having me in this uh, uh, podcast. Looking forward. Yeah, thanks so much. So could you tell the listeners just a little bit about yourself? Sure. So uh, I think that before anything, I'm a scientist by training. Uh, and science has been and continues to be my passion. Uh, before it's, before uh, before establishing Amendo and while taking the role of the CEO, I think that uh, the scientific angle and... Uh, the wonderful things that uh, uh, you can do with it. That's, that has always been my passion. I have a PhD from the Weizmann Institute of Science and Structural Biology. Actually, my, uh, my professor from back, from back then is Ada Yonath. She's Nobel laureate for 2009. My expertise are around protein engineering and structural biology. And a lot of what Amendo is, is based on, on that. Uh, uh, but in addition to uh, to loving science, I think that you know since childhood I've always been entrepreneurial. Uh, I think that I founded my first company before completing my PhD, uh, and Amendo was probably the fourth. Uh, so uh, that has always been my passion as well, and that's why I'm, I find myself doing what I do, uh, and not in the academia, for instance. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, your background's very interesting as well. Cause I, I mean, as I looked back through, it looked to me like you had like a finance or investment kind of uh, background as well. You work for, for companies in that space too. Right. So that's also, uh, also uh, an, an interesting development because uh, when I, when I, uh, you know, f- completed my PhD, uh, I had to, I had to make a decision, uh, whether I, I stay with science, uh, and I stay in academia and I go and do a couple of postdocs and take a position or I go and do something else back at that time. And that's also because of my, my, the research that I, that I held, you know, during my PhD was, uh, very, very high resolution atomic level questions that I had to answer. And I have always been interested in the broader picture. Uh, I wanted to see and feel the applications. Uh, And in addition addition to that, I was, uh, you know, I had like fatigue uh, from uh, uh, from doing the actual hands-on research and uh, being, as I said, entrepreneurial, uh, I said, okay, so how can I enjoy bo- both uh, science and, and business and being entrepreneurial? And then I turned into uh, a founding together with a partner, uh, a small investment firm. Uh, and it was great fun. And it was extremely interesting. And you get to cover 
uh, a lot of technologies and you see everything that is, uh, that is going on around. But uh, at some point, I think it was after five years, five, six years of doing that, I miss the hands-on ownership uh, to be responsible for, you know, making something, building it, mm -hmm. creating value, not just supporting the value creation, actually doing it with your own hands, leading the people. Uh, so that got me back uh, from, uh, from investments to, uh, uh, to actually, you know, building startup companies and taking them uh, forward. Yeah, it's. I mean, it it's an understandable um, background in your in your journey. I mean, I definitely, um, as I was as I was going through school, I definitely liked the learning process and kind of going through uh, everything that we had to go through to establish my PhD. But in the end, I was I was ready to be done as well. And um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's it, being an entrepreneur now, you know, and having responsibility for everything you know, is something that, uh, you know, is, is a drastic difference than working, working from somebody for, for somebody as well. Yeah, I, I <clears throat> completely agree with that. And I also think that, you know, that's, uh, um, I think that when you're an entrepreneur and when you're a leading entrepreneur that eventually takes the CEO seats and seats and you, uh, you practically are responsible for everything. Uh, being able to connect all dots into something that makes sense and then you then executing it, that's something that I love. And mm -hmm. I think that I have found my sweet spot, actually. Uh, so I'm very happy about that. Like, you know, because eventually your career can take you, uh, can take you to so many directions. But although I have been doing, you know, different things, I think that eventually they led me exact to where exactly I need to be. And, and, you know, it's good. I believe that it's good for everyone. When you're able to navigate your career to that exact place, that means that you're better in what you do. You're better for yourself. And you're better for the investors and you're better for everyone, anyone that follows you. Yeah, that's great. That's great advice, actually, for, for anybody that's, that's listening as well in terms of finding that. Uh, it's not just finding your passion, but finding the spot that you belong more or less uh, as well. Uh, I agree. And actually, you know, uh, you know, sometimes before you experience that, and that's also something that I'm very happy about. I thought it's, you know, you know, being an investor is actually, you know, when you come from scientific work, you go to, you go to being an investor, it's glamorous. You think that it's wonderful. It's probably, you know, the best development in your career. And you learn from that and you say, okay, that's nice, but it's not enough. So also experiencing not being afraid to take bold moves because the easy move for me post, uh, post my PhD and I had, I had a pretty successful one was to go and have my postdoc and continue with that path. I had the opportunities taking the, you know, the different path that take me to, takes me to, you know, to being an investor is not a trivial thing to do, but it was the right thing to do. Yeah. Uh, I learned a lot and it brought me back to exactly where I need to be. So That's taking cool. bold moves and changing and, and, and testing it, learning from it, you can always change back. That's great advice. So let's talk about Amendo for a minute. So um, where does the name come from? So Amendo is uh, practically in Latin, it's amending. And since Amendo, uh, you know, uh, amends the DNA in some ways. And along the way, of course, many other things, uh, we thought it was a good choice of a name. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, especially given the company, I mean, this is the, where I'm going to make the pivot to talking a little bit more about Amendo. But I think um, uh, to me, you know, looking at what Amendo is doing, 
is uh, very important as well. And um, so would you share just a little bit of, you know, the, the background of the company and what is it that you're working on? Uh, yeah, so let, let me start from the very beginning because the, the start was, uh, I think, uh, I think it may, may, had a major part uh, in everything that we are now. And uh, Amanda was founded uh, 2015, uh, late 2015. So it was, uh, I don't know, uh, a year and a half after the first generation CRISPR companies were founded. In Italia, CRISPR Therapeutics, Editas. Uh, and uh, I think uh, around three years after Jennifer Doudna's and Emmanuel Charpentier's uh, discovery that, that CRISPR works well in uh, mammalian cells or could work in mammalian cells. And, you know, since, since the discovery, I found it fascinating. And when, comp when the first companies was founded back on, based on that technology, I said, whoa, like, it's actually happening. So we are, uh, we are actually going to, uh, to manipulate DNA of, you, of, of you know, live human beings in order to, to cure them. And that was uh, uh, that was fascinating for me, and that's what attracted me there. But then, where do you come in? Because the technology is there, right? There are companies who are already developing it, but it's very early. Uh, the technology was so promising that uh, it made a really fast move towards becoming companies, and then these companies went public at very early stages of uh, not even <laughs> preclinical work like in vitro work wow. um, just because of the promise, right? So, so uh, um, I was there together with my, uh, my uh, co-founders and I say, okay, so that's, that, that something great is happening here. How can we become part of it? And the thing that attracted me and I think all of us to uh, gene editing generally and CRISPR, CRISPR gene editing specifically is uh you know is being able to cure people i think that it, this is like just transformative times in in healthcare generally it will have uh it will have a huge effect uh because uh it's a, a conceptual change from you know mainly symptomatic treatments to actually going to the source of the disease and being able to fix it and then cure people, uh, uh, so uh, that was uh, that was the, the the motivation. Now we had to think, okay, so that there's this wonderful technology, but eventually it will be successful if it gets to as many people as possible, if it cures as many diseases as possible. Now we started working with CRISPR just to see uh, uh, to see how it works, and the initial promise that I thought of said, "Okay, this is amazing. It's it's like magic. You have this protein element with an RNA element. It is a kind of a cassette that will effectively target any place along the genome, which is an amazing process, promise." But then biology and reality together knock on your door and they, they show you that it never works <laughs> uh, exactly as you anticipate it to be. Uh, and, uh, we, we, and that's something actually the, the, that, that didn't change since inception. We said, mm. okay, we want to bring it to as many people as possible. First thing that we want to deal with is safety. You know, we remembered what happened with gene therapy uh, uh, back in the 90s, right? In the 1990s. Right. Uh, it was tragic, it was dramatic, and it was due to off-target effect, mm -hmm. right? So we said, okay, if you want to bring it to as many patients as possible, you have to make it as safe as, as you can possibly uh, uh, get it to be. Uh, so the first objective was, oh, okay, we'll take... Uh, uh, we'll take uh, uh, CRISPR gene editing and we'll do everything that can be done in order to potentially eliminate off-target altogether. I'm not talking about just, you know, making it less or making it tolerable. We will aspire to eliminate it. Um, 
this is uh, uh you know back at the time i can tell you even our investors our 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 series a, uh, a investors were ordimed and takeda uh and they were saying whoa whoa sure you want to say that <laughs> Alex, you're going to eliminate uh and we say listen i don't know if we'll get there but that's what we have we all of us in gene editing have must aspire to because mm -hmm. this is that's uh, like you you want to make patients better you don't want to 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 take any unnecessary risks uh so that was goal number one we established a whole platform that takes uh, uh the wild type uh crispr nucleases and uh uh, and uh, engineers them in all sorts of ways that we have developed. And of course, we, we use AI for that. We use uh, uh, my personal and others in the company, personal background in protein engineering in order to get that. Uh, I can say, uh, fast forwarding to our lead program, uh, I think that we're the probably the first ones that were able to present the FDA with actual data that shows non-detectable off-target whatsoever. Wow. Uh, even at some point we had just one and then we had to deal with the fact and we made it go away and then we had to deal with the fact that we had to explain the, the FDA that, yeah, we had, we had one, but now this one is gone as well. So, <laughs> and actually it is a challenge when you have to explain such thing. Uh, so that was objective one, number one. Objective one, number two, again, in order to make the, uh, the technology available to more and more patients is make more genes targetable. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Uh, so there are a couple of ways uh, to do that. One, one thing that we chose is, uh, is uh, that we said, okay, there's no one solution fits all in biology. Uh, you know, the nucleus that was, uh, that was originally discovered in, in, in 2012, SP-Cas9, it's a great nucleus. It's not the only one. There are thousands and thousands of nucleus, and they're, and they're different from one another, have different sizes, they have different functionalities. So we say, okay, so first of all, in order to broaden the uh, potential applications of CRISPR, we don't want to rely just on one. We want superior, superior nucleuses that are different from one another. Based on that, we are able to apply additional editing strategies. So we are able to target more loci eventually along the genome. Uh, just to give you an idea, with uh, uh, SPCAS9 alone, you target more or less 5% uh, of, uh, of sites along the genome. Uh, uh, with our panel of nucleases, we cover 86%. It gives you flexibility eventually. Sure. Yeah. And uh, in, in addition to that, we were able to develop novel, novel editing strategies and we were working on several factors uh, that are uh, uh, conjugated to, to, uh, uh, to the CRISPR nucleases in order to make our toolbox as rich as possible. And with all of that combined with uh, unprecedented safety or off-target profile, I think we will be able to treat more diseases eventually. That's amazing. I mean, it was actually one of my questions for you. Just thinking about today's uh, episode, I was thinking, I was wondering, you know, is uh, is Cas9 the only, you know, the only way to edit? But it, you've answered that. You've answered that question very well. Mm -hmm. That uh, that you guys are actually developing. You know, other methods, and then I picked up on your website as well. For anybody that's not as not aware of this. On your website, it says that, you know, Amendo uh, wants to make CRISPR better. And, and that's where a lot of this description, you know, as well is coming from, um, you know, I believe. Yeah, uh, uh, exact, exactly from that. Like trying to make uh, uh, CRISPR better eventually is CRISPR is a holistic technology. And you see, by the way, gene editing, I think, uh, you know, there are, uh, Amanda, of course, you know, uh, uh, there, there are a couple of gene editing companies out there, a couple of CRISPR gene editing companies out there, and more and more companies, there are uh, developing, uh, uh, again, different editing tools. And eventually, 
combine together all of these technologies, I think that they really have the potential of uh, uh, changing a lot of what of of uh, you know healthcare as we know it to date. Yeah, well, I mean, I I just think how far we've come, you know, just in general with other with other modalities, and now with the promise of what CRISPR could deliver as well. I'm looking forward to uh, to seeing the impact that it can have on mankind and the diseases that we face today. Um, in terms of the pipeline that you're working on at Amendo, uh, can you give us any examples of, of something that we might see sooner rather than later? Uh, sure. So, so our lead indication uh, targets uh, uh, severe congenital neutropenia uh, or Elaine. The gene is uh, Elaine. Uh, 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 it's uh, uh, and I'll relate the the disease to Amendo's uh, platform technology. Uh, I have mentioned at the very beginning that uh, that we have developed tools that gets us to extreme levels of specificity, uh, meaning eliminating off target uh, altogether. But when you have highly specific or extremely specific uh, editing tools. What can you do with that that others cannot? And then mm -hmm. we thought, okay, so we're eliminating off target. Just to give you an idea, off target, you have the on target site, right? That's where you want to cut off target. Usually would be uh, would have three on average three mismatches uh, uh, along the genome. You know, with the CRISPR targets, let's say between I know. 18 to 22 bases. So you'll have three mismatches, mismatches, and that means you get a certain level of cuts where you don't want it to happen. Mm -hmm. We said, okay, but we, we were able to eliminate that. But, we, but, but then we thought that we want to actually make more genes targetable, right? We don't want to go after, you know, after the same exact uh, targets as everyone else goes after. And then we say, okay, what if we could do a little specific editing in a broad manner? Uh, you have two alleles, one you get from uh, your mother, the other from your father, and they have very little differences between them, right? Right. But uh, these differences are either mutations or SNPs uh, 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 that, are, that are different. So we uh, developed a technology that in a broad manner can differentiate between the two alleles based on a single mismatch. And it doesn't matter to us where the mismatch is. Elaine is an autosomal dominant disease or a dominant negative disease. That means that you have one allele that carries a mutation that generates a toxic effect and you have another allele that produces a healthy protein uh, that you want to keep. If you're able to do allele-specific editing, you're able to leave the healthy allele intact to keep producing the, the healthy protein that is needed, and you manipulate only the, uh, the mutated allele. So that's Elaine. We were able to do exactly that. Uh, so we're the first ones who are, uh, uh, who are developing in advanced stages in a little specific, a little specific approach. Uh, we will uh, uh, um, um, file our IND uh, Q4 this year, and then uh, uh, Q124. Uh, we're excited to uh, start, you know, uh, with the efforts to cure these patients. Uh, Amazing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and that's and, and that's uh, and that's the the first uh, uh, first indication. Like, um, I would love to tell you more about our pipeline because it also has uh, a kind of uh, I don't know methodology behind it. Uh, yeah, because we had to, absolutely. Yeah. Please share. Yes, I I mean, and and I and I do want to encourage anybody that's listening to this as well to go visit the Mendo website because you have your. You have your pipeline, you know, out there as well um, that I saw as I was prepping for the show. And I mean, it's amazing to see how many things that you have lined up. I mean, it's it's not just, you know, one thing, it's several. So I'll let you continue on, though. 
Right, yeah, we're working on quite a few thing, uh, things these days. Uh, uh, but again, if I go back to our motivation at the very beginning, we said that eventually we want to treat as many diseases, as many target genes, and as many people, right? Mm. So we have started for very you know, obvious reasons with Elaine, which is a rare genetic disorder. There is a very uh, a clear connection uh, between the genotype and the phenotype eventually. Uh, and it's a very good starting point. And I think the entire industry started with that, right? You want to treat the severe diseases that has a clear connection between genotype and phenotype. Going forward, uh, we said, okay, but we, we want, of course, to continue treating rare diseases, uh, but what about more prevalent diseases? So we, we, we kind of designed our pipeline in a way that will first validate uh, uh, the technology by uh, uh, treating severe rare diseases, going more and more towards more prevalent and potentially non-monogenic diseases. And I think that that's the promise of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, CRISPR, CRISPR gene editing or gene editing generally. And I think that that's where the, the entire industry is heading for. And the more companies that generate data, and there are quite a few, and data data accumulates, and we see that they actually, uh, you know, we get more confidence about safety and about efficacy. Then it will, for sure, move to that direction. So when Mendo, at Mendo, we decided we'll do it will uh, uh, target uh, uh, target uh, uh, cardiovascular diseases. Uh, that's our uh, next priority in the pipeline. Uh, and we have chose uh, we have chose uh, LDLR, the LDL receptor, as a target, uh, and ANGPTL3 as it as as uh, as our next targets. Now, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, hypercholesterolemia or familial hypercholesterolemia, that's our uh, next indication. It affects you know it is. Uh, uh, a monogenic disease, but it affects one in 220 people worldwide. So it's highly prevalent. The, the, the treatments that are available for these patients are statins that we all know, right? Daily. Uh, uh, and uh, so that's one thing. And there are the, 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 the new kids in the block are anti-PCSK9s or uh, PCSK9 inhibitors. Uh, and uh, and then under development, there are for, there's for instance Verve, who knock knocks out uh, knocks out uh, PCSK9 altogether. Why statins and PCSK9, and what's different about Amendo? So statins and PCSK9, they're both of them are are aiming for the same result. That is increasing the level of LDL receptors that are presented on the surface of the hepatocytes. And when you have more receptors, you increase the uptake of LDL from the bloodstream, and therefore you have lower levels of, uh, of uh, LDL, which is proven to be, uh, 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 to be an important thing. So the, the thing is that uh, even though you have these existing, uh, uh, existing solutions, uh, you have, uh, I think, today uh, more than uh, uh, 7 million people uh, just in the U.S. and EU that are not at goal, although they take both. So something is missing there. And we thought that from the very beginning, let's see if we can find with the Mendo's platform, with our ability to generate this uh, or to develop this novel editing strategy, something that will be more efficient than that. And uh, we, we have developed uh, a, a new editing strategy uh, that interestingly we took, uh, uh, you know, that principle we took from, from a paper that we saw that uh, was showing an Icelandic family. And these, this specific Icelandic family had a deletion of the three pri of part of the three prime UTR uh, which is part of the LDLR gene. Uh, and then the outcome of this uh, natural 
uh, the reason was that they were they had a, a significant elevation of representation of LDLR. They had very low levels of LDL, mm. and they were generally very healthy. So he said, okay, this is six, the, that's interesting. It works direct on the LDLR gene and it shows very promising, uh, uh, it seems like a very promising, uh, promising approach. So we took that, we took the natural thing and, uh, uh, and of course optimized it, made it better. The deletion that we have gotten to is significantly more effective. And what we would want to offer eventually is the one and done treatment to hypercholesterolemia. We'll start with familial hypercholesterolemia, which is, again, monogenic form. But there, as I said, there are many, many uh, people out there that are not at goal, uh, although they, they take both treatments. And I think it's a huge, uh, huge promise. By the way, not just for uh, uh, the patients or the, the uh, themselves, but generally for the public, right. like if you, you know, if you, it's, uh, uh, that's why I think, you know, if you do that and if it works really, really well, and by the way, you have to price it properly eventually in order to get you as many people because, uh, uh as many people as possible. And that's a whole other discussion. Uh, but if you're able to do that, you will eventually get a significant disease decrease and uh, mortality due to cardiovascular diseases, which is still the number one cause uh, of uh, of uh, death in in many countries. Uh, so, um, I think that that's uh, uh, that's actually uh, yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward. They are uh, very promising. Yeah. yeah, I I was actually it was interesting to me. So I was actually in the best shape of my life. And uh, my cholesterol was high enough that I needed statins and uh, slowly changed my diet around enough that I, that I no longer needed statins anymore. Um, so I'm still not on them. And each time they test my blood, it comes back fine. But uh, it was one of, those, one of those moments in life where I, just, I remember telling the doctor, I was like, look, I mean, I have, I'm carrying around the least amount of fat that I've had on my body in my entire life. And yet you're saying that my cholesterol is high. And so we, we did, I think it was two or three rounds of, you know, testing along the way. And it did come back under control, um, you know, with statins pretty quickly. But then, um, you know, I, my whole goal then was how do I, how do I find my way back off of these? Because I, I didn't want to be mm -hmm. on them. And so, uh, you know, I got things under control. But, uh, yeah, I do look forward to to seeing, you know, more solutions like this in our future because I think, you know, similar to, to my story, um, you know, other people, you know, may feel healthy or, or be at their healthiest point and then just have something you know, that isn't quite right. And, you know, wouldn't it be nice to just have a one and done solution to your point? Uh, that would be wonderful. In your career, um, what is one of the biggest challenges that you've faced and what did you learn from it? Um, well, that's well. I had quite a few, you know. It's uh, uh, twenty-five years of a career, the moment. So I had quite a few, but I, uh, well, I'll first speak generally about the biggest challenge of, that I see in what I do, and that's, uh, you know, when when you're when you're the CEO of a company, uh, you have to manage many different interests and wills uh, of, uh, of, of different, uh, really different people, different, uh, different motivations, different interests. You have investors on one hand and they, they want, uh, uh, you know, they want their money back at least <laughs> and, and preferably uh, <laughs> to make significant earnings and their investments. You have that. You have the people that work really hard uh, uh, with you in order to develop uh, uh, develop this uh, the, the technology and the great solution and the promise, and above all that, you have the patience. Mm. Uh, com you know, considering all of these different interests, 
uh, is sometimes really, really hard. I had experienced that specific thing when I was, uh, when, when we had the discussions or the negotiations back in 2020 or whether to merge or whether not to merge. And you have, uh, and you have, uh, uh, you have really different interests around the table, around the same table, and you have to make decisions. If you go one way, someone will be unhappy with that. If you go the other way, <laughs> another one will be unhappy with that. But eventually, you're in a position where you have to, and that's the preferable uh, option, when, you ha- when you're able to get everyone aligned, mm. understanding that no one gets everything that they expect, but, and that's something that I strongly believe in, the best solution or the best option is the one that makes everyone happy to some extent. Everyone has to give up something, they get something in return. And then, uh, and from that point, uh, uh, you move, uh, you move forward when it's possible. That's what you want to get. Sometimes it is not possible and you still have to make a decision because <laughs> Uh, you have uh, uh, you have a company uh, eventually that uh, uh, that you need uh, you need to lead and uh, uh, but I found that to be uh, the most the most significant uh, challenge. Also, you know, think about you know think about financially. You have investors on one hand; they want to see results very fast. They want to see value creation. You have patience. You want, and I, and I said from the very beginning, the first, uh, uh, the first motivation that we had, the first goal was to, 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 to create an unprecedented level of safety, but it takes time to develop it. So yeah. what is the sweet spot there that, may, that, that gets you to a point where you say, okay, this is enough. Now we have to move forward. This is it. This is design freeze. From this point on, uh, we go forward. Uh, so that's just some of the challenges. Yeah, I would say. I mean, it, you know, being the being the leader of a company like Amendo as well is is um, you know c- can't be easy at all times. Um, but at the same time, rewarding. Hopefully, on the back end as well as you start to see the impact that it's having on patients. So, yeah, I definitely can appreciate that position as being being a challenge and a way to learn along the way. How do I? How do I evaluate my trade-offs? And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, nothing's going to be 100% accepted by everybody. That's just the way that, that the world works. So I agree. True. By the way, I'll just uh, uh, add to that, that the only ones that I think that you uh, cannot compromise and their interests are eventually, the, you know, the patients. Yes. yes. There yeah. you cannot make any compromises. Very important point. So there are three questions that I like to ask every guest. What inspires you? Um, I think that I'm 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 inspired by uh, human beings that make significant impact on the world when they have the right positive motivation to do so. Mm. So it's not only what you do. Uh, I think that I, I, I think that almost a motivation uh, or my, what motivates you is more important than the outcome in, in many cases. And I will uh, uh, forgive uh, someone who had the right positive motivation that wanted to do good, to do good, but eventually things, turn around the wrong way than someone who had the wrong motivation <laughs> and somehow managed to do something that is, uh, uh, that is amazing. Although, you know, I'm, um, especially as an entrepreneur, as a CEO, I do believe that execution and getting what you intended to get is, uh, eventually that's how you're measured. That's how everything is measured. And I, uh, and you know, that's my every day, but I don't miss out on the motivation part. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that that's, uh, you know, and, and you know, there are, uh, 
wonderful human beings out there doing wonderful things. Uh, but I would always look at what motivates them as something that is, uh, uh, that is a very, very significant and important element. So important. Thank you for sharing that. And what concerns you? Uh, oh, where, where should I start? Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll say, I think that what concerns me at the moment is something that concerns all of us. So I won't be original here, but, uh, I know AI very well. I have a very strong, uh, uh, computational team. We use AI, uh, we develop a, a you know, deep, uh, deep learning, uh, 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 algorithms in house. We use them. We enjoy the outcomes. The more you know AI, uh, the more you realize uh, the potential. You know, potential great things that you can do it, but how devastating it could be if it is not controlled. Mm -hmm. So. You know, I'm, I, I love technology. I love what we do at the Mento. But I think that this is the first time. Once I got to the idea, that, got used to the idea that we're, man, you know, we're going, manipulating people's genes. Uh, and, and, you know, at the beginning, it, it took me a while. Uh, I think that this is tech-wise, or if, you know, even if you look at, you know, all uh, uh, developments in the past few decades. This is the scariest uh, thing, the most wonderful thing that happened to us, but also the scariest ones. And I really, really hope that uh, regulators, governments, whoever is there, uh, I hope they work really hard uh, to define define a framework. Uh, uh, for AI developers and boundaries and controls uh, because you can do good with it and you can, you could potentially do really bad with it. Yeah. And yeah, that's, I, I'm telling you as, as that as someone who, you know, practically develops uh, uh, AI uh, technologies and someone who enjoys that a lot. It saves us a lot of money and time, mm -hmm. but there's a big butt over there. Where do right. you stop it? <laughs> yeah, I think that's I think that's kind of everybody's fear. And then I, I, I know from my side with the US government wanting to, you know, sort of understand it more and like, you know, take a step in, as much as I appreciate that, whenever it came to the understanding the internet, initially they were describing the internet as a series of pipes that joins all of our houses together. And it's like, okay, come on, guys, you gotta come up to like at least where we are today. And then gain an understanding and then you can, you know, maybe build a task force or something like that to go, you know, look at ways to better regulate this. Right. Because uh, I agree with you. I mean, it's it's both uh, exciting and scary at the same time. Last question. What excites you? Um, what excites me? Um Well, I think that, you know, with that, um, um, I think that, you know, achieving uh, my goals, uh, that excites me. Setting goals uh, and then, you know, just seeing it happening real. Mm -hmm especially yeah. as an entrepreneur, especially as an inventor. Like I have, well, you know, I've written many patents, I've founded companies. And when you, when you think about it and, and you say, okay, just a moment, this is something that uh, if I wouldn't have done it, or if we have, wouldn't have done it, it would have, wouldn't have been here. Uh, looking at creations like that, and again, I go back to the motivation thing. I I hope that I come, you know, that, that I come with the right uh, motivation. Seeing it materialize, seeing it becoming something that wouldn't have existed existed otherwise, the realization 
that's very satisfying and exciting. It goes away after 24 hours uh, <laughs> and then you and then you go after the next goal. But right. still, this, that, that, that's one of my, my biggest drivers. Amazing. Well, David Barham, thank you so much for sharing all of your thoughts with us today and talking to us about Amendo and all of the great work that you guys are doing. And thanks a lot for being on the Life Science Success Podcast. Thank you, Don. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Life Science Success. For complete details about this podcast, including show notes, how to get in touch with guests, and more episodes, please visit www.lifesciencesuccess.com. If there's someone you'd like for us to invite to the show as a guest, please let me know by sending me a message at the podcast website. Please click subscribe on your favorite podcast app, share the podcast, or tell a friend about it, and last but not least, rate the podcast. Thank you again. Thank you again.